When developing a software, most programmers will definitely prefer working with programming language that offers a good set of libraries to work with collection of objects like arrays, lists, or sets. It helps them to work directly and focus on implementing the business logic of their application rather than spending their time implementing the underlying data structures and algorithms. Before we move forward, let me clarify some very important concepts so you don't get confused along the way. Here are the possible questions that you might ask. What is an abstract data type or ADT? And how is it any different from the previous data structure that we've been discussing like array? First of all, you may recall that the data type is simply an attribute which allows you to tell your compiler or interpreter how data will be stored and used during program execution. Since the beginning of this course, we've been working with simple data types like int, float, and car most of the time. Well, generally speaking, we classify data types as either primitive, complex, or abstract data types. Technically, an abstract data type, or ADT, is only a conceptual model for data types, whose behavior is defined by sets of values and operations from the point of view of the user. This is in contrast with the data structure, which is the actual implementation in code to support the operations as defined by the abstract data type and based on the point of view of the implementer. So, ADT answers the question of what operations are to be performed on a given data set, while data structure answers the question of how these operations are to be implemented in code by specifying how data will be organized in memory and what algorithms to use in order to perform the expected operations. Thus, the word abstraction means the process of exposing only the essential features that the user can do with the data type and hiding the internal details of how it works behind the scene. In this topic, we will explore the .NET's built-in abstract data types in working with collection of objects like stocks, queues, lists, and so on. You will learn how to use these ADTs in code and work directly with your collection of items. Most importantly, all throughout this course and for the rest of the succeeding videos, you will learn how to implement these underlying data structures and algorithms to build your own user-defined ADTs. It is because not all programming languages offer similar built-in ADTs to work with collections. And the way they implement the underlying data structures and algorithms is slightly differs from one programming language to another. So knowing how to implement one your own is really a good start in becoming a good programmer. And you will not be limited by your current platform or framework. So let's get started. In C Sharp, there are two namespaces that you need to reference when working with collections. The system that collections and the system that collections that generic. The system that collections namespace allows you to define various collection of objects such as array list, queue, bit arrays, hash table, dictionaries, and so on. And on the other hand, the system that collections that generic was added in the .NET framework 2.0, which allows programmers to work with collections that are type safe at compile time. I'll explain this concept further in the next video. To understand this better, let us have an example that uses two of the most commonly used ADTs available in both namespaces the array list under the system that collections and the generic list under the system that collections that generic namespace. Array list is similar to an array, but it lets you work with collection of objects whose size can be increased dynamically. So when we talk of abstract data type, as the user of this type, I only need to know what operations I can perform with this type. And I don't have to worry about how these operations are implemented behind the scene. So in an array list ADT, it allows you to add an item to the end of the collection, insert an item at a specified location, or remove an item from a specified location. Here's the link from Microsoft to complete list of properties and methods you can use when working with array list. To create an array list, we declare a variable of type array list and use the new keyword to instantiate the collection. As simple as it is, if you want to add an item, just type the variable name and use the add method, and then pass in the value to be added. For this example, I'll add 10, 4, 5, and 14. And as you notice, I don't even have to define the size of my array list as it can dynamically grow as new data is being added. Similar to an array, I can retrieve specific elements by specifying its index like this. Number at index 2 is numbers index 2. And I can assign item to a specified location like this. Let's check the output. And as you can see, I was able to access item at index 2, similar with the built-in array data structure we used before. 
to insert an item, I can use the insert method and pass in the index and the corresponding value. This, in effect, would push item 99 and 14 to index 3 and 4, respectively, to insert 88 at index 2. To verify it, I'll iterate to our array list using the for loop first. I'll say for int i is equal to 0, and for as long as i is less than the numbers that count. Now, array list doesn't have the length property nor the get length method, but rather the count property is used, which is basically similar to the length property used in array. So I'll display each element one by one and let's check the output. So the array list content is 10, 4, 5, and 14. Then we replace 5 with 99 at index 2. And then when we inserted 88 at index 2, 99 is pushed to index 3 and 14 at index 4. Note that we can also iterate through an array list using the for each loop like this. Let's check the output. And every element gets displayed, though we lose the capability of displaying the index number as we displayed each element since we did not use the iterator variable i. So for now, I'll revert it back to using the for loop and collapse this for each loop in a region. To delete an item from the list, we can call on the remove method and you can specify the value of the object you want to delete. I'll copy this for loop one more time to display the element in the array list. Let's check the output. And as you can see, 88 was removed from index 2 and 99 and 14 were moved back at index 2 and 3. You can also specify the index by which you want the element to be removed using the removed at method. I'll hide this code first, and in this example, I'll remove the element at index 0. Let's check the output. And as you observe, 10 was removed from index 0, and in effect, all elements from index 1 to 4 are shifted to index 0 to 3. These are just some of the common operations you can do with array list. There are other operations that you can do like sorting and searching. Let me add this code. Numbers that sort, and then I'll display all the items, and finally, I'll search for 88 using this binary search method. Let's check the output. So here's the current content of our array list, and then 10 was removed, and 4, 88, 99, and 14 were shifted, and now, after the sort method, elements in the array list were sorted, and the message 88 is located at index 2 is displayed. So what's the takeaway? Working with built-in ADTs is fairly straightforward. From the perspective of the user of this array list, you just provide the data and call the desired operation you want to perform, if available, and you'll get the result right away. But from the perspective of the implementer by which this course is focused on, there is an underlying data structure and a combination of algorithms that work behind the scene to accomplish this task, and some of which you have already seen in the previous videos when we deal with basic searching and sorting algorithms. In the next video, we are going to look at another abstract data type, the generic list, and show the similarities and differences as well as their advantages and disadvantages. This will give you enough idea on what operations to include when building your own user-defined ADT and how these operations might be implemented internally. So once again, thank you for watching, and if you are interested for more video lectures like this, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you haven't watched my previous videos in this lecture series, links are provided below or simply click this playlist on the screen.